The invasion of Crimea started with an information attack. News reports seemingly designed to turn local residents against Ukraine and towards Russia. So information radiation or information influence or the narratives or the information warfare also influences our hearts and minds. Then came the proxy forces with pro-Kremlin biker groups and volunteers mobilised to protect ethnic Russians from what they claimed was a threat posed by Ukrainian nationalists. These facade groups that we were talking about, Cossacks, a Russian community of Crimea, they would create the appearance of a local uprising. Finally came the Russian forces, though without markings on their uniforms. They definitely look like some kind of commandos from a, a thriller movie. They were really big men, properly dressed. It did not look like anything of a local self-defense as they were presented. Analysts called them Russia's little green men, though President Vladimir Putin initially denied his troops were involved in the unrest. It created enough of a grey zone to prevent many Western politicians in early 2014 from fully grasping, until it was too late, what was going on in Crimea, even as these Russia-backed forces took control of airports military sites and the parliament. A referendum was rushed through in which residents voted for accession to the Russian Federation. I had a feeling that someone actually crushed my house, turned it over, you know, and actually uh, put its hand on, on a very intimate thing like personal clothes and stuff. In a matter of weeks, the biggest land grab in Europe since the Second World War took place with barely a shot being fired a significant victory for a grey zone operation. But these tactics of deniable meddling fell short when tried in eastern Ukraine. Instead of covert action, there was open fighting, offering a sense of 21st century armed conflict, where new weapons like drones and cyber attacks are combined with more traditional tanks and rifle fire. Evidence of what's at risk when the grey zone becomes a war zone. My name is Deborah Haynes. I'm the foreign affairs editor at Sky News. And you're listening to my podcast, Into the Grey Zone, which explores a murky evolution of warfare. I'll explain the covert tactics used by states, criminals and terrorist groups to deceive, gain influence, and at times, kill. In this episode, we explore Russia's annexation of Crimea and the conflict in eastern Ukraine. We also talk to the UK's military chief about operating in the grey zone and how the armed forces are changing. You know, and the fact that World War II came to an end in 1945, there are now very few people alive who experienced that. <clears throat> and of course, the upshot of that is a lot of people don't know what war is like. And therefore, they don't necessarily have the same incentives that our fathers and grandfathers might have had to manage the risk of going to war in the same way. General Sir Nick Carter is the head of the UK's armed forces, who we met in episode one. He joined the army when he was 18 and has spent the past 44 years in uniform, so is someone who does understand the risks involved. I don't think that any of our opponents genuinely want to go to war in the way that we would define it. And that's because they are able to realise their ends, to achieve their objectives, without necessarily going that far. Um, and I think that that's the, the, the smart way that it's being done, which is why I always say that the real risk is if that way of operating, or even fighting ends up leading to a miscalculation. What he means is if hostilities in the grey zone or an actual war zone were ever to escalate out of control and draw in more countries. And that's the thing that keeps me in bed at night worrying, is whether a lot of the sort of quite high-octane activity that's going on, in whether it's Libya or Syria or the edges of Iraq or Yemen, 
or in the Eastern Mediterranean or further afield, whether that blows out of control. And what you end up with is <clears throat> politicians not necessarily knowing where this is headed and ending up with an escalatory set of steps which lead to a miscalculation. What's the gravest threat to the UK? If any of the conflicts that you see around the world today gets out of control, or if there is a misstep from whichever policymaker is sitting over the top of the inputs to those conflicts, then that's where the risk will come from. And of course, weapons have proliferated significantly. Um, you know, one of the features of what our authoritarian rivals have done is to develop new technologies which they haven't just kept to themselves, they've diversified it and proliferated it to their proxies and to their, um, their customers. And that means that you've got a, a world with far more weaponry in it, and including nuclear weaponry, and of course including biological and chemical weapons in it than perhaps we've had for many years. And that means that a miscalculation could be really rather horrific if it occurs. Do you believe that the, the, the grey zone can threaten a country to, you know, in, in as dangerous a way as an armed conflict, as in take topple government? No, I think they have to be applied with other tools as well. I mean, they're, they're, they're very useful um, scene setters and um, means of achieving a, a, you know, a, a vulnerable state of affairs. But of course, what we see Russia doing uh, very vividly, and we saw this with little green men in the Crimea, and we see it with its use of private military and security companies, particularly Wagner, in countries like Libya, Mozambique, and for that matter, Syria, is there comes a point probably when you have to tip the thing over the edge, and that does require some form of physical capability to be used. As we've heard over this series, attacks in the grey zone can be used to weaken a target society from within by amplifying divisions, boosting the power of compliant politicians, or eroding trust in government. At the extreme end, such tactics can be used to soften up your opponent for if you did then want to launch some kind of military offensive. And, in the same way, as advances in technology are changing how countries compete in the grey zone, they're also changing the way armed forces fight actual wars. When people think about war, they have a 20th century paradigm in mind where war is about mobilising armies, navies and air forces, invading the territory of your opponent and occupying it until you come to, to terms. General Sir Richard Barons retired from the military in 2016. His last job in uniform was as head of what is now called Strategic Command, which we learnt about in Episode 5. It's the branch of the armed forces that, among other things, covers cyber warfare. General Barons knows a lot about what is referred to as the Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's basically anything involving technology from artificial intelligence to quantum computing and how that is changing the way countries fight in the grey zone and in war zones. In the 21st century, if your objective is to break the will of your opponent, the means will exist, in fact exist now, to do that without any form of territorial invention. So, for example, if you wanted to break the UK's will to contest whatever it is that's at issue, uh, you, you might well uh, attempt to do it through a combination of offensive cyber activity, difficult and hopefully getting harder in the future, the use of long-range precision conventional, so high explosive, not nuclear missiles, also targeted at critical national infrastructure. And the effect of those two things, cyber and missiles, amplified through social media to cause mass concern amongst the civil population. I think that if, we were, if the UK was subjected to about two weeks of missile attacks removing power, water, telecoms, cyber attacks that amplify that and add new harm, and social media messaging telling them that this is only going to get worse, then uh, we would quickly find that uh, our, our will to resist was depleted. And if you did that, not a single enemy boot or plane or ship has come into your territory. Well, presumably we could fire back. So presumably we could fire back if we had the tools to fire back. And in the era of precision, long-range precision, uh, long-range precision conventional missiles, we don't have them. We have nuclear missiles, which are clearly not a suitable response to that sort of uh, attack. Let me step in here with a bit of background to help explain. Since the end of the Cold War, 
the UK and much of the rest of the NATO military alliance effectively took a peace dividend. Political leaders hoped the collapse of the Soviet Union kind of meant peace in our times. They reduced defence budgets and diverted funding into more voter-friendly areas, like health and education, while the size of armies, navies and air forces shrank. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq didn't really reverse this trend. They just meant remaining resources were channelled more into helping soldiers fight insurgencies than into new technologies or maintaining capabilities to counter threats from hostile states. While all that was happening, opponents like China, Russia and Iran were busy developing weapons and tactics to be able to defeat the West's military dominance. And they didn't just focus on trying to build better aircraft carriers, fast jets or submarines. They also took an asymmetric approach. Just think of the damage a barrage of super-fast missiles or a swarm of armed drones could cause to large legacy military equipment, like warships or tanks, perhaps coupled with a surge of social media posts and videos to amplify the psychological impact of any attack. It's worth remembering that even when states do descend into a real shooting war, it's still a battle over people's minds as much as their ability to fight. For the UK, in terms of fighting capabilities, missile defence is a particular weakness as the government hasn't invested enough in things like air defence systems or in developing its own hypersonic, long-range conventional missiles to be able to hit back or to deter. So you can see US and UK military asking for these missiles because they can see their potential opponents have already got them. So maybe we should catch up. Cyber warfare is also changing military calculations. If you're able to get into your opponent's controls for their air defence radars, you can fool them into thinking a missile is incoming or perhaps jam their ability to spot something that really is heading their way. So your cyber resilience has got to be good enough that you have complete assurance that what your reconnaissance assets are telling you is the truth and it's not the picture that your enemy wishes you to see. And what about the increasing autonomy of weapons? Artificial intelligence, or AI, responds much faster to a threat than a human brain ever could. And that could be vital to be quick enough to fend off an attack. But this could, in theory, mean a future war happening without a human in the final stage of the decision-making chain because they can't react fast enough. So we're used to the idea that an intercontinental missile will cross the world in about 40 minutes. And our radars and satellites are good enough to see the thing being launched and we'll see the trajectory that they're flying. And in there, you've got time to spot it, to ring up the president or the prime minister who's got to deal with this, and there's enough time to think about what are you going to do. Not a whole lot of time. My guess is eight to ten minutes before that missile then reaches the end of its journey and whatever's going to happen, uh, happens. Now, in the future, uh, due to the advent of hypersonic missiles, so missiles that go somewhere between five to 20 times the speed of sound, then that time to think about it has disappeared completely and you'll only be able to respond at the speed of AI. So you would have to have complete confidence in you knew what that AI was going to do and you would have tested it through endless, endless scenarios. But the opportunity that existed in the past for a human to say, I, I know what the machine is saying, that doesn't feel right, let's do something different, will have gone. So you could literally have a conflict that would be over in a matter of minutes? Yes, because of the vulnerabilities induced by the speed at which the attack is happening, whether that's a cyber attack or a missile attack. So, and how, how fast could a missile then travel from one side of the planet to the other? Well, uh, at up to 20 times the speed of sound, what now takes uh, 40 minutes is going to take 12 minutes. Wow. Quite scary. Yeah. The conflict in eastern Ukraine didn't involve hypersonic missiles, but it did see conventional Ukrainian forces significantly tested by a combination of attacks via Russian drones and artillery fire, coupled 
with information and cyber operations. I had a feeling that someone actually crushed my house, turned it over, you know, and actually uh, put its hand on, on a very intimate thing like personal clothes and stuff. Amin Zaparova is Ukraine's first deputy foreign minister. She's also a Crimean Tatar, an ethnic minority group indigenous to the peninsula. She was working as a journalist in Crimea in 2014 when Russia invaded. I may assure you that we never expected this, uh, to, to experience uh, this brutal aggression uh, from the country that we used to think is our strategic partner and neighbor, and actually the one that claimed to be a brotherhood nation for Ukraine. We still have aggression of Russian Federation going on, not only in Ukraine, with the ongoing occupation of Crimea and the whole bunch of the consequences, like colonization of uh, Crimea, when from one hand, Russia has been uh, creating the conditions when the citizens of Ukraine have to abandon Crimea, like myself and, and thousands of other Ukrainians. And from another hand, massively motivating and bringing Russian citizens to the uh, occupied Crimea and reshaping the demography of Crimea and kind of putting loyal uh, people uh, to Crimea. Crimea's status has swapped around over the centuries, but it became an autonomous republic within an independent Ukraine following the collapse of the Soviet Union. The peninsula still had cultural and historical ties to Russia, with many residents speaking Russian. Moscow kept a naval base and thousands of military personnel on the territory as part of an agreement with the government in Kiev. But old alliances started to crumble in 2013, when pro-Western protesters took to the streets of the Ukrainian capital to rally against the then-president, Viktor Yanukovych. He'd just scrapped plans to move Ukraine closer to the European Union, instead sticking tight to Russia. By February 2014, what became known as the Maidan Revolution turned increasingly violent as pro-government snipers started firing on the protesters. Well, these latest pictures show police firing at a crowd of protesters in Independence Square. At least one officer is said to have died in today's fighting. It's reported that at least 22 people have now died in new clashes in Ukraine between police and anti-government protesters. This is the scene in Independence Square in Kiev. Then, on the 22nd of February, the president's hold on power suddenly collapsed and he fled. Interim leaders, friendly towards the European Union, took charge in what Russian analysts claimed was a CIA-backed plot to pull Ukraine away from Moscow, as opposed to a genuine grassroots uprising. Uh, Ukraine is uh, maybe uh, the first uh, best example of the hybrid war. Sergei Markov is a political analyst and former member of the Russian parliament. He claims that Washington was the initial grey zone actor in Ukraine, not Moscow. This hybrid war uh, was of the, the war of the United States against Ukrainian uh, democratical, uh, uh, democratical and legal government led by Viktor Yanukovych. United States intelligence service uh, organized uh, paramilitary groups of neo-Nazists who uh, occupy the center of Kyiv also uh, by uh, uh, controlling of uh, global media and uh, partly Ukrainian media, United States intelligence service community organize uh, information war against um, legal Ukrainian president. Russia has never provided evidence to support these claims, though, and the Ukrainian government strongly rejects them saying they're part of the disinformation campaign spread by the Kremlin. As the world's attention was focused on events in Kiev, Russia saw an opportunity in Crimea. The operation to seize Crimea has been held up by the Russian military as the gold standard of using information activities to achieve your objectives without any fighting. Keir Giles is a Russia expert from the think tank Chatham House. 
who we've heard from in earlier episodes. Because what the Russians did over the days leading up to that intervention in Crimea was gradually take control of all of the traditional media in Crimea, to television, press, radio, and so on. And then when they launched the operation, the first step was to take over the internet exchange point in the capital, Simferopol, and the cable connections, telecommunications cable connections to the mainland, in order to ensure that Russia actually had complete control over all the information coming into and out of the peninsula. So nobody in Crimea had any other sources of information than what the Russians were telling them. And that's been presented as a key ingredient in this amazing achievement that Russia did of taking over Crimea with barely a few shots fired and only one fatality, and that was an accident. Drumming up support to break away from Ukraine, Russian state-backed news reports described the interim government in Kiev as a fascist junta. Sergei Markov accuses what he describes as an illegal junta, of repression and attempting the de-Russification of Ukraine. People in Crimea appraisal against illegal uh, uh, junta, which uh, grabbed power in the February of uh, uh, 2014 and who started uh, uh, massive repression against their political opponents and uh, had the plan uh, of uh, violence derussification of the uh, Ukraine. A decision by the Ukrainian parliament to repeal legislation that gave the Russian language an official status in Ukraine was seized upon by pro-Kremlin voices to fan fears that Kiev planned to trample on the rights of Russian speakers in Crimea. Pro-Kremlin activists started to mobilise, as did Russian troops in Crimea, as well as special forces secretly brought in from the Russian mainland. The special operations soldiers didn't wear any badges to betray their nationality, pretending instead to be local self-defence forces, though few in Ukraine were fooled. Can you remember what you thought when you first saw these um, little green men, as, as people kind of described them, the Russian troops without the insignia? Well, they they definitely look like some kind of commandos from uh, from a, a thriller movie. They were really big men, properly dressed. It did not look like anything of a local self defense as they were presented. Orisia Lutsevich is from Ukraine, but she lives in London and works as a research fellow at the Chatham House think tank. These facade groups that we were talking about, Cossacks, um, a Russian community of Crimea, they would create the appearance of a local uprising. They took control of airports, military bases and other infrastructure, including the parliament building, under the guise of seeking to protect ethnic Russians. But of course, when they put the Russian uh, flag on the Ukrainian parliament um, and they started dispatching some of more violent uh, groups, they used it to put down the pro-Ukrainian protest, to make people afraid go on the streets, for example, to support Kiev. The authorities in Kiev appeared reluctant to respond with force to what was unfolding in Crimea, fearful of making the situation worse. Thousands of Ukrainian troops were stationed on the territory at the time. Most refused to defect, even when surrounded by Russian forces. But they also chose not to fight. The local Crimeans were mobilised to go to Ukrainian military bases to uh, uh, prevent from any Ukrainian troops or uh, soldiers to leave the base. And when they were given order from Kiev to to basically mount resistance, many of the commanders were saying, but we cannot mount resistance against civilians. They were probably not aware at the time that these civilians were mobilized by the the Russian special force operations to give them a free way. On the 25th of February, a crowd of pro-Russian demonstrators surrounded the Crimean parliament, demanding a referendum on joining Russia. What Moscow described as a legitimate referendum took place on the 16th of March, though there was no option on the ballot for Crimea to keep its status as part of Ukraine. Russia claimed 97% of the votes. They announced the referendum and there was no choice for people but basically either to stay home or to comply with the occupational authorities. It it was taking place under the 
under the gun, um, this whole sham. Sergei Markov has a different view. It was a will of the Crimean people uh, to leave Ukraine and to join uh, Russia. President Vladimir Putin initially denied his troops were involved in the Crimea operation, even as Western intelligence agencies were telling their governments that they were. The smoke and mirrors appeared to be enough to make certain members of the NATO military alliance hesitate instead of acting to stop the unfolding land grab. Crimea seems to be a really good example of how tools of the grey zone used to a level can can change the facts on the ground. Keir Giles again. Absolutely. Uh, Before the conflict is actually declared, uh, part of the aim is presenting a fait accompli, presenting the facts before you even get to fighting about them. And of course, the reason why it remains in what we might call the grey zones, or remains below the threshold of open armed conflict, is primarily because nobody has decided to say that this is actually an act of war. Things didn't go so smoothly, though, when Russia-backed separatists started rising up in parts of eastern Ukraine against the government in Kiev, as Ms. Lutsevich explains. Russians had a strategy to prevent Ukraine from moving closer to Euro-Atlantic structures, to becoming part of NATO, becoming member of European Union. So what they did right after they annexed Crimea, they moved, moved up north, if you want, and they started this uh, fermenting a protest in Odessa, in Kharkiv, and the first big city that they took over was uh, in months after the annexation called Slavyansk. So this whole project of Russian Spring, as it was called, was meant to show that the people of southeast of Ukraine are against uh, Western uh, vector for Ukraine. They are against Kiev. A report by the RAND think tank describes how Russia rather than sending in special forces, as it did with Crimea, instead tried to use a mix of local activists, fringe political groups and businessmen to create the instability. They also launched a significant disinformation campaign aimed at turning public opinion against the Kiev government. Ms. Zaparova said groups describing themselves as non-governmental organisations or NGOs would also spread the pro-Kremlin narrative over the following years. Uh, We can't see radiation, but it really affects our health. So information radiation or information influence or the narratives or the information warfare also influences our hearts and minds. I really want to motivate people to check the information that they consume, whether it's a TV or an online media or a newspaper that they read or a magazine that they read. A goal of the separatists in 2014 was to convince Ukraine's government to allow a federal system that would give more power to the regions and so greater influence to Russia. But this grey zone attempt alone to bring about change didn't work. Ukrainian security forces arrested many of the rebels in a standoff that turned violent. Within months, Russia was sending weapons and eventually troops across its border to bolster separatist forces in what descended into a war zone. We saw that in the use of Russian artillery and Russian unmanned aerial vehicles to target conventional Ukrainian military. General Barons has given evidence about the conflict to the UK Parliament. And that was done in a way that you can't really deny. A lot of people uh, were killed and injured, a lot of equipment was, was damaged. But it was done in a way that didn't engage the international community who were not present. Military experts think Russia used the conflict in Ukraine to try out new techniques. This included combining military strikes with information operations, like sending ominous text messages to Ukrainian troops about how their bodies would be found in the snow at the same time as targeting them with artillery rounds. The chaos of war also brought international tragedy. You're watching Sky News. It is five o'clock British summer time here in London. And staying with this breaking news story tonight, dramatic story that it appears that uh, a Malaysian Airlines plane may have been shot down 
and the uh, incident seems to have happened close to the border between Ukraine and Russia, some 50 kilometers short of the Russian border, short of Russian airspace. On the 17th of July, 2014, Malaysia Airlines flight MH17, travelling from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, was shot down over rebel-held territory in eastern Ukraine. All 298 people on board were killed. A Dutch-led team of investigators said the surface-to-air missile system used in the attack came from Russia. The Kremlin denies involvement, but evidence, including audio messages and images, has emerged to undermine the credibility of these denials. So the, the facts are clear, but they are still denied. And uh, that is, I think, just a feature of how you operate in the grey zone. And it's not new. If you think back to uh, things that occurred, for example, in the Second World War, which were terrible, which to this day, the facts are clear, but they're still denied. There's nothing, there's nothing really new about this. And, and the issue is really... Not that it's denied, it's just, it's just what is it that the rest of the world is prepared to do about this? There were harsher sanctions against Russia in response to the downing of MH17 and more support for the Ukrainian armed forces. But none of this was enough to bring about an end to the wider crisis. There's even no tangible ceasefire now that it's almost seven years and uh, believe around 14,000 people died in, in Donbass in this war. Ms. Lutsevich again. Right now, they only managed to control two cities, two uh, big regional cities of Donetsk and Luhansk. And they are creating some kind of a, a proxy state that, uh, that resembles more Soviet Union, you know, with the ideology of the Soviet glory. With, um, uh, um, and it became this kind of a gray zone for four million people that live there, which means they're unrecognized by Ukraine, they're unrecognized even by Russia. Can you just explain like, how you see uh, the, a military of the future that can deal and that can fight in the grey zone? I'm back with General Carter, the UK's military chief. It's a military, first of all, that's got to be, clearly it's got to be modernised because it's a military that's got to be able to deter the sorts of capabilities that our opponents have developed over the last 10 or 15 years. So <clears throat> I talked about subsurface stuff in the maritime domain. I talked about electronic warfare being linked with drones, being linked with um, long-range missile systems to defeat um, tanks and so on, armoured vehicles on battlefields. I talked about anti-access denial systems. All of these capabilities that they've developed have got to be countered in one way or the other. It doesn't mean you have to match them, but you have to counter them. Because if you don't counter them, you won't have got deterrence in place. General Carter and other military commanders talk a lot about modernisation because much of the UK's military equipment is either out of date or in need of an upgrade. The Defence Chief spoke to me at the end of September 2020. A few weeks later, the government announced a decision to allocate an extra £16.5 billion to the armed forces over the next four years. Clearly, good news for the General. In fact, it amounts to the biggest investment in defence since the Cold War but there will still need to be painful decisions to cut or reduce capabilities, and most likely troop numbers, to free up cash to ensure all remaining equipment, like warships, jets and tanks, are fit for 21st century warfare, where being able to use data is arguably as important as being able to fire weapons. The Ministry of Defence must also invest much more aggressively in future technologies, which will involve taking risks on projects that will likely fail until one succeeds. In the past, this whole area of innovation, in my opinion, has been way too underambitious, largely because the bulk of overstretched defence spending has been locked into legacy equipment programmes like aircraft carriers and fast jets. It's a massive challenge and means a fundamental adjustment in the entire military mindset, putting technology and data alongside or even ahead of big metal objects. And it's not just about equipment. It's also about how you use your people. 
And the first lesson of prevailing in the grey zone is to make sure you've got deterrence set and therefore you are able to do to them what they wouldn't like to have done to them. So that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing you have to do, I think, is to try and find ways of preventing them from achieving their objectives using what I've described in the past as fait accompli strategies. And then it requires you to adopt a sort of campaigning style of approach to how you deal with those threats. Rather than sort of a series of tactical responses, you've got to think from the status quo back to the risk and then work your way through that in a much more strategic way than perhaps we've been accustomed to during the course of the Cold War. So that kind of a change of mindset, really. So it's not like it's not as if we're on ops and then back off and it's like, ah, relax. So it's, it's, it's a change of, the, to get you can't. So you can't have a, mili- a peace mentality anymore. You need to be constantly uh, alert and, and, and competing. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it is. So, so what we might in the past have called an exercise is actually telegraphing a statement of intent um, or it is being used for other purposes. And therefore, what you have to do is to recognise that that is actually a small tactical battle in this longer term campaign, which is about trying to have an impact upon your opponent. What he's talking about is a pretty significant shift in the way the armed forces are used. Instead of a distinction between being on an operational tour somewhere like Iraq or Afghanistan and then being back at home, now any kind of training or exercise, either in the UK or abroad, is viewed as a way to send a message in the grey zone to adversaries. So what we've got to do, I think, in this competition that we're discussing is to work out how we can put boots on the ground uh, to achieve the sort of presence that will prevent vacuums from being created for your opponents to fill, but do so in such a way that you manage the risk of casualties in a way that is acceptable to public opinion and to policymakers' appetite for taking risk. In the industrial age, the West very much had the advantage. They, were the most, they had the most powerful militaries. Um, are you worried that that's changing, you know, that, that, that actually there is a risk that the, this Western dominance isn't by right and actually could be um, overmatched by uh, countries like China developing a technological advantage that could then mean that they would be able to just mm. uh, you know, outmatch us in all the different domains? Uh, definitely. Um, I mean, I think we see that. I mean, China is a, a, an extraordinary country for innovation and technological innovation for that matter. And, of course, um, there is always um, in the character of warfare a constant competition between opposing technologies to try and get match or overmatch. So the answer is yes, that is definitely something that needs to be understood and dealt with. You talk about how like, so the armed forces, obviously, they exist to defend the nation um, and, and, and our allies and our interests. Um, but when it's like the, the nation's minds that are under attack. And when it's the, the institutions, the pillars of our democracy, so the judiciary, the press, um, the, our, our government, our, our, our freedom to, to elect and our freedom to speak, when it's that that's being undermined in the grey zone, how can the military help to defend that? Um, well, the first thing to recognise, of course, is that the military can only play a supporting role in this. Uh, because ultimately it's going to take other government departments and other instruments of statecraft to protect it. And I think all we can really do is to make sure that our part in all of that is as professionally delivered as it possibly can be, and that we are very clear, a point the Secretary of State is often making, about the threat. And, you know, we do act as a conscience, as one would do as part of the nation's insurance policy, to make sure people understand the threat. Um, And then clearly it's up to us to lobby to make sure that that threat is dealt with in a properly holistic way. And what can people do? What's your message to people listening to this podcast? Because you're talking about a grey zone, you know, the front line, everybody's on it. No one's too unimportant to be targeted in this grey zone. Can you just speak to people? What do they, what should, how should they act? What should they be aware of? How can they build their own resilience? Um, I mean, I think my starting point is to Uh, is for people to recognise how lucky we are to live in the sort of society that I've certainly grown up in and you have as well, and that protecting the values that that society represents and the openness associated with it 
is all of our jobs and tasks as individual members of this country. And I think that's the starting point for all of that. Then I think, you know, there needs to be um, a genuine desire by people to be really considered in what they believe and to think pretty hard about where that news is coming from and what it actually means. Um, and then, you know, if it's the wrong news, if it's fake news, if it's disinformation, to call it out. Uh, and we should be up to calling it out because ultimately <clears throat> it undermines everything that we all stand for. So you've more than four decades in, in the military. How has your thinking about the threat and the utility of force and how force needs to be calibrated. How has that changed over, from then and to now? Now, when I was growing up, um, it was very black and white who the enemy was. And our total focus in military terms was on defeating the enemy. And we coined a term called the manoeuvrist approach, which essentially gave you the tools to get after that enemy. What has changed since then is that the environment now has probably produced and introduced multiple actors that need to be thought about as well. And a lot of that is down to the pervasiveness of information. So if you're going to go after the enemy, first of all, you need to be really clear who the enemy is. Then you need to be really clear about the other actors that are going to influence you achieving that objective, whether that's the local population, whether it's the support of the population back home, whether it's allies and partners that you're working with to achieve the outcome. There will be a range of different actors that you need to think about. And therefore, it's become a, a much more complex process working out how you achieve your objectives. The objectives now in this murky, information-influenced world are much harder to understand and to get after. It's become more complicated. It means this absolutely cannot just be a challenge for the armed forces. It's one for the whole of the government and every single person in the country to be alive to. It's changing the way the most secret parts of the state think and operate too. For the first time ever, two members of MI5, the UK security service, who tackle the threat posed by Russia, have agreed to an interview to talk about their work. Tom and Kate met me at MI5's little-known underground museum at their headquarters in central London. Tom came to the meeting with a small black box in one hand. He placed it on a table as we said hello and then suggested I open it. But that's next time, as we continue into the grey zone. Into the Grey Zone is a Sky News podcast. It was edited and produced by Chris Scott. With production support from Sophia McBride and Michael Greenfield. And narrated by me, Deborah Haynes. The head of Sky News Radio is Dave Terrace. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.